So here we are back in the studio with the somewhat much disputed Fujifilm X-H2S. The reason why I think it's somewhat of a much disputed uh, camera, I think specifically amongst Fujifilm users, is because it doesn't seem that folks are kind of thoroughly convinced that there are actual substantial enough upgrades to move either from the X-T series, X-T3 or X-T4 over to the X-H2S. Or they feel that Fuji has somewhat <clears throat> lost its soul or lost its form. So in this video, I wanna to touch on just my initial impressions of the camera kind of its build quality, the ergonomics, and some specific use cases that I'm really excited to try this camera out on. What I've seen thus far, and kind of what I've handled thus far, I'm, I'm really excited about. I'm, I really enjoy this camera, um, the few the few shoots that I, that I have had with it so far. I come from the X-T background, so I started out on the X-T3, I graduated to the X-T4 because of in-body stabilization, 4K60. So my primary uses for a camera are studio settings like this, commercial work, I really enjoy landscape photography. Um, I do also really enjoy traveling. And, uh, and I do stock video. So um, high quality, you know, high frame rate is really important to me as well. When I had the X-T4, I actually had the Lumix S1H cinema camera. Um, about a year ago before I traded it in and I actually I loved I loved that camera So I was kind of waiting kind of biding my time in the Fuji world uh, I, I knew I loved Fuji. I loved the colors. I love the ergonomics. I love the classic feel The very manual approach to the camera. That's kind of what I learned on the exposure triangle And I think that that was something that was really important to learn on um, However, I kept holding out hope. It's like well, am I gonna keep keep holding out for the X-T line or the X-H1 was released a few years ago. What's the update going to look like? Maybe, just maybe, this is just the smaller cousin of, of the, uh, the camera that I, that I really, really enjoyed, the S1H. And after having used it a couple times, I can, uh, I can confidently say that this, this camera it's truly, truly a compact hybrid. So there's really five main reasons why I thought the upgrade to the X-H2S from the X-T4 was worth it. The first being in-body image stabilization, of course. Um, I do a lot of handheld stuff with uh, stock video and um, kind of on-site commercial shoots. And so I found that, you know, just having that additional seven stops of stabilization was was a pretty important upgrade from the X-T4. And the autofocus, which I know, I know there's, there's still a lot of kind of flack about whether or not the autofocus uh, is justifiable in making that upgrade. But with the stacked BSI sensor on this camera and the improved, you know, autofocus algos and everything else, um, you know, I'm, I'm really counting on, you know, the stickiness of the autofocus and the tracking to be just as good as Canon and Sony. So that's something I'm really excited about. So autofocus stability. 4K 120 was one thing that, that I've been wanting for quite some time. You know, uh, X-T4 had 4K 60, which is great. The 1080 120 and the 1080 240 on the X-T4 uh, were actually pretty good. Uh, the 120 was, was very good. The 240 broke up quite a bit, but the 4K 120 is something that um, that I definitely was looking forward to for quite some time and I'm looking forward to in this camera. Um, the next was 6.2K open gate. That's really exciting. I've never had any sort of exposure to open gate before. Just the thought of, you know, having all the data and resolution off of a full sensor and having the ability to crop, you know, anamorphic or, or whatnot. It's just really exciting to me. So that was, you know, the fourth reason why I wanted to make the upgrade to this camera. The fifth really was external RAW. Um, I've never recorded RAW having, you know, X-T3 and X-T4. I do have a monitor on the way that I will be able to start being able to record external RAW, which is something I'm super excited about in ProRes because I use, I use uh, Final Cut Pro and that renders nicely. 
from what I've heard. Those are really the five primary reasons why I wanted to make the move and try the upgrade with this camera. Now, since, since actually having it in hand, uh, I cannot get over the fact of how small this camera body is. It is crazy small and it just, it fits so nicely in the hand and it just, it feels like, you know, just a small powerhouse, like, like I was referencing before with the S1H. It really does feel like a, a smaller cousin of the S1H. I have seen a bit of concern kind of around the layout and of the buttons and, uh, and the fact that the, uh, the wheels no longer click in. Eh, that's a that's a minor annoyance to me. Honestly, that's that's not going to make or break the decision to uh, to make to make a camera move uh, to me. I mean, again, it's it's a minor inconvenience. Um, there's plenty of other uh, customizable buttons on this on this camera to make up for that. Um, the other big controversy of this camera was the fact that they turned the manual continuous and single switch into a button. Uh, I was never a fan of the switch, um, so I think it's a massive upgrade. And then the uh, the last um, big er ergonomic thing that I, I really love is um, the cu the seven custom modes. It's it's amazing. It's so amazing to me that something as as simple as that makes such a quality of life difference when you're you know kind of on site on the job. You're switching back and forth between you know. 4K 120 and 6.2K 24, and then you want to snap a couple pictures, you no longer have to worry about flipping to movie mode, adjusting your shutter, adjusting your ISO, and then flipping back. And again, like that's part of being a Fuji user is almost signing up for that experience and kind of going through the motions. And that's fine, but you know, every millisecond, every second that you spend kind of making sure that your settings are all dialed in, that's time that you potentially miss the shot. So I think the adoption of the PASM dial is a strategic move and a great move. I, I don't blame them for that uh, whatsoever. I think it will help lure some Sony and Canon users over to Fuji, which you know what, the Fuji fam is is big and I it's my hope that it, it only gets bigger. Us Fuji fans do love Fuji very, very much. So I, I'm not super concerned about this move. I don't think that it, is any sort of, you know, um, foreshadowing that, you know, the manual shutter ISO aperture kind of classic modular setup is is going to be replaced. I think that that sort of modular kind of uh, tactileness uh, runs true within the Fuji ethos, and I think it's going to continue. So I'm not too concerned about that. A couple other ergonomic things to note: CF Express. Type B, SD and CF Express. I think it's time to upgrade. Um, <laughs> to be honest, like if you're if you're buying UHS Type Two cards, SD cards, because you know you're you're taking that sweet sweet high res video. Those cards are some of the most expensive pieces of plastic you'll ever pay for. And to be honest, making a jump from like a 128 gigs, you know UHS Type Two to a, um, a 128 or 256 CF Express card. It's not that much of a difference to be completely honest. So I think storage might be a make it or break um, more for like photographers with this camera because it's hard to, to use both cards as a backup since they're two different types. I just think that CF Express cards are eventually going to, um, you know, they're not leaving the market anytime soon, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, the other big quality of life differences, full-size HDMI, it's got a mic, it's got a headphone jack, none of that dongle nonsense on the X-T4. My goodness, Fuji, what were you thinking? And then it uh, and then it rocks the same, same battery as the X-T4. The shutter button is quite a bit softer. Uh, again, I don't mind. A couple of the quote unquote challenges that I know that have been brought up in other videos <clears throat> that I'm definitely going to be on the lookout for are overheating. I didn't get the fan attachment. I didn't see the need to. Initial reports that I've seen 
uh, from Fuji and other users is that you really only need the fan attachment if you're if you're shooting like super high res for a super long time. And, and that's just not, not really my style. Most commercial shoots I do, I do either in 1080 or like 4K 24, 200 megabits a second. I am looking to shoot more raw in the future, uh, which, which could be something I consider is just the fan attachment. But um, initial reports and reviews that I've seen, uh, I don't think I need to make that move quite yet, but I'll be on the lookout for that. And I'll definitely share my thoughts if overheating does become an issue uh, for this camera. I do appreciate that Fuji proactively thought about this and considered it as a, uh, an alternative add-on. Now I've spent like a day customizing all of my uh, customization dials and kind of dialing in the camera. So I have spent some time messing around with the system. The menu system is something that I'm very familiar with. Again, coming from the X-T4. So I might have missed something, but when I am in photo mode and auto ISO, I'm not sure if anyone else has seen this, but auto ISO one, two, or three doesn't give you real time ISO feedback. So custom mode one I made for 6.2K at 24 and uh, auto ISO, same ranges, for auto ISO one, two, and three, but this one gives you real-time ISO uh, numerical values while it's adjusting for exposure compensation. It doesn't do that on the photo side though. Kind of a mild annoyance I would imagine though for photographers because you obviously wanna consider um, the noise introduced to your image. So Fuji, you're probably not watching this, but if you happen to, <laughs> I'm sure a simple patch update would, would fix that. I'm hoping that feedback can be passed along in some way, shape, or form, and just a quick, quick update could be made. Uh, again, or I could be using, the, I could be missing something in the menu. I'm not sure. So if you do know the answer, feel free and comment and share because I'd love to, uh, love to be able to get that fixed. Another big quality of life uh, upgrade I think in this camera that could be looked at as small, but it has flickerless shutter capability. And the S1H had this as well, and it was kind of one of those deep dive functions that, um, unless you knew about it, it, it actually you know provided a lot of value. So whenever you're you know uh, taking any sort of video within the setting of fluorescent light, there's a frequency that fluorescents uh, have that can some sometimes and oftentimes interfere with uh, with your shutter. And um, what you don't want is if you're shooting in 24 you know, and your shutter is set at 48 or 50, you don't want to be making those massive shutter adjustments um, because you want to stick to that general kind of cinema rule of, of two times. But the flickerless shutter capability will allow you to adjust the shutter like 0.2 stops at a time, something really, really minuscule to kind of dial out those fluorescent interference that you see will streak across your screen because it's interfering with the shutter speed. That's amazing. You can now dial out any sort of uh, fluorescent interference by making minute adjustments to your shutter. So thank you, Fuji. That's a awesome improvement. So is it worth the upgrade? Yes, it's, it's absolutely worth the upgrade. While I think this camera is more uh, video centric, I do think this is finally a true release of a modern hybrid, true hybrid camera where Fuji has made enough improvements to both the photo and video quality of life in this model that I can, I can confidently say that, that I think it would be worth the upgrade. There are some quirks about it and I'm sure based on how you shoot and where you shoot, you'll, uh, you'll kind of need to figure out how to cater this camera to best suit your needs, but I think this camera is, is a step in the right direction. I think if you classify yourself as a hybrid shooter and you kind of lump yourself into that creative population, I think this is definitely a serious contender and, and worth considering an upgrade. And overall, I think it, it offers some future proofing with all of its movie and media modes that will still make it a very relevant camera in the next few years. All right, thanks so much for watching the video. I kind of felt like this was a bit of a rambler. I just wanted to kind of get my thoughts out on this camera because I know that a lot of other people 
kind of in a similar situation, seeing the camera and what it what it's capable of doing, and really on the fence about whether or not they should purchase it and add it to their to their kit. So I hope I, uh, I answered some of those questions for you uh, with some real life footage and some real life experience. I am looking forward to testing this out more and more and excited to bring you any new updates um, along the way. Feel free and leave a comment down below. I'd love to interact with you and I will see you on the next video. Peace.